recording so let me find it here. yeah and Maureen, you will turn it over to David about a positive thing we can do, right? And that, David, will happen around 3.35. Okay, thank you. Hey, thanks everyone for uh, participating. This is uh, an amazing panel. This is gonna be fun. Thank you. You're welcome. Harry, will you be going to the Caledonia meeting on November 6th? No, I'm not. Are you? No, but I'm sending uh, our star graduate student, Nova Tebby, who's been doing these NDC policy briefs. Great. Great. The briefs have been great. Okay, um, I think yeah. uh, the main thing, can I just um, ask the speakers to try to keep to the timing? We have a very packed, uh, fabulous panelists, uh, but we're gonna try to keep to the timing. I think we have a little bit of leeway at the end. Um, there is a four o'clock awards session um, that the Academy has asked us to announce. What's the maximum time? Um, for you, Elvis, or for the, we're supposed to go to 345, um, but you have 10 minutes to talk. Okay, good. Well, it says seven minutes, but I, I'm not going to make commentary. I will let you do the talking and open it up to questions. I'd rather have you speak. Thank you. I can cut that out. I need nine members only. Hi, Victor. Good morning. Hey, how are you doing? Hello. Good yeah. afternoon for you. <laughs> Hi, Victor. Hello. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah. I'm excited to talk to you guys. We Is are everybody there? We're, we're jazzed to uh, hear from you, uh, Victor. Oh, well, what I'm going to tell you, probably you can anticipate, and you've been following my emails or my letters, you know we're doing a lot of things in climate, and we're just so excited. It's a the good fact piece. that uh, you're it's so committed piece. to it. The piece uh, that just came out in the New England Journal is a really good piece, Victor. Thank you. Okay, so let me do the following then. First, thank you. I mean, as you can imagine how excited I am, this interest group started only two years ago and really is going gangbusters. Um, so much energy and interest in this area. And I thank you because the Academy serves our members and of course serves the nation and globally. And I can't think of a more important issue than climate and human health. I have to thank many of you because many of you are the ones who point out to me how important the issue is. And as we were looking at a few years ago, where were the major issues that we were going, you know, um, focusing Dr. on? Dr. Sal, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I haven't gone live yet. So, uh, so um, if we're ready, I'm gonna go live. So the- Okay, I'm important. ready now. Yep, okay. And, uh, and just to confirm, Michelle, uh, we're not playing the in video introduction for Dr. Sal right, in his live. Listen, let, let me go live. They're just waiting for me. No, okay. we're, we're, two minute, we're two minutes before uh, quarter till, or one minute. Oh, so yeah. I'm a little confused. I think, so in other words, then other people who come in hasn't come quite come in yet. Is what you're saying? No, we have over 100 people signed up, and there's only 20 right now. Oh, okay. Well, why don't we wait then? Yeah, yeah we're we, just great we to see many of you who are already signed up and in. I know most of you and just want to say hello. Why don't we wait till more people come in then? Yeah. H Jose, yeah. are we are we seeing everyone or are we in in two different groups? I'm going to the live stream right now for the public. Okay, and can you find out as Elvis Paul got disconnected again? He looks okay. Hello? Yes, okay. we hear you. We hear you. Great. Great. Okay, the live stream is up, and I um, mean, we got, yeah, you, you can start whenever you're ready. Uh, I'm going to let the uh, chairs decide what they want to do. Well, I'm going to introduce you um, briefly, um, Victor. It'll be just a few seconds. 
Great. Okay. Let me know. Are we live now? Yes, oh, ma'am. Uh, yes. Jesse, we live? Yes, we're live. Yeah. We are. Okay. Good morning, everyone, to interest group number 19, Climate and Health. Uh, I'm Michelle Berry, the Dean for Global Health at Stanford and the director of the Stanford Center for Innovation in Global Health. I started my life off as a tropical disease doctor and then directed my research towards global health. It soon became clear that the greatest threat to global health, the planet, and my grandchildren was climate change. And in response, we started a human and planetary health program at Stanford and a unique planetary and human health program fellowship with the London School of Tropical Medicine. I've jumped into this area of climate and health and really uh, have had the privilege of working with the Biden administration transition group. Um, today, this steering committee consisting of Maureen Whitfield, Fr Francesca Dominici, Phil Landrigan, and my co-chair, Jonathan Patz, have designed a hot day as we will hear about the impact of wildfires, extreme heat, and drought on health. Please put your questions in the chat function um, because we have over a hundred people signed up and we, we don't wanna miss your hands. Um, we will ask you to unmute as we call you from the chat function. Um, please also um, frame a question. Um, we do very much hope that you give suggestions and commentary, but we'll be unmuting for questions only. The first person to talk in welcome you is Victor Zhao and he needs no introduction. Um, as many of you know, he's the president of the National Academy of Medicine. But I just wanna say one word that Victor has really been instrumental uh, in bringing climate and particularly these issues to the forefront of global conversation. Victor, on to you. Oh, thank you, Michelle. And uh, thank you, John. And thank all of you, uh, particularly the uh, organizing committee. I think that's uh, Maureen, Francesca, Philip, and I bet you I'm missing somebody else. But I think the point I wanted to make is thank you. Uh, you know, this interest group started two years ago and you can see even the first meeting, tremendous interest. And as we go forward, I think the members are truly activated and believe in this important issue. I have to thank a number of people because I was looking back a few years ago you know, this was not in the major agenda for us, but it was people like uh, Charlie, um, Charlie Halpern and Lynn Goldman and Dick Johnson, others who said, this is really important. And of course they are right. And, you know, uh, as I said, our academy serves the members, we serve the nation, we serve globally, and I can't think of a more important issue than this. So we are indeed, as Michelle said, have put a lot of effort into this, I would say, for me, the majority of my time, among many things that I do, this is certainly the one that takes up the most time because it needs that kind of guidance and development. Because it is a very complex issue, it's new, in looking at human health from the aspect of climate change. And I think as we take this project forward, I th as I see it, the um, community has responded really and to a large extent, the climate community and those who support climate say, well, you know what? You guys have a unique story to, to really focus on human lives and the public health crisis and what it means in equity shines a light to the urgency of the issue because most people think about it somewhat differently, you know, multi future generation. I think Johnson has a slide that has a polar bear sitting on a piece of ice and people think about climate change that way. But I think importantly, we are really talking about human lives and that's what we're about. So with that, um, with a lot of hard work, we have now worked for about two years through planning, through gathering, through advice, through consultation, and of course, through fundraising and building the program to be where we are today. I would say that last year at the annual meeting, I launched the grand challenge on human health and climate change. A year later, we have lots to report in terms of progress. Uh, importantly, as we look at our grand challenge, which we believe, well, it is the second grand challenge in the history of IOM and AM, 
And we believe it's a phenomenal challenge that will engage public, private, from all sectors, focused on human health and equity. In this regard, I'm very pleased to tell you in the four areas we're working on, which is communication, critically in communicating as a public health crisis, mobilizing our community as messengers, nurses, doctors, researchers, and all aspects of, of the biomedical health community to message to patients, to each other, to practice what we should be practicing, and importantly, to communicate to the public. We have a program we're working on that will be quite extensive in doing that. Second issue, as you know, is a roadmap, which is looking at transforming systems. All the systems that, in fact, intersect between climate and human health. That would include agriculture and food and transportation, energy. The idea would be to bring everybody together to see what, kind, what can we do to change the system. That will be uh, the product of a major consensus study, which will have policy implications. Third is actionable items to transform our own sector. And I'll come back to that. And fourth is research and innovation. And we're moving along, as you will hear in my uh, remarks, that we work with Barrow's Welcome Fund. They are starting a new grant program that look at intersection with climate change and health. And we're gonna host several workshops to bring scientists together from different fields to look at what is it, what do we need, and how do we actually begin to have research program, RFP and others. So that's very exciting. Now, on the third one, or actionable, as Michelle said, you might have seen our paper in the Journal of Medicine. These were written by the four co-chairs of what we call the Collaborative on Decarbonizing U.S. Health Sector. And I think if you look at co-chairs, you can see we certainly have brought together unique people who's going to have to make a difference. We have the government, uh, Rachel Levine, the Assistant Secretary of Health, who's overseeing HHS climate and the center for health and climate and health equity. We have Sir Andrew Whitty, who used to be the GSK uh, CEO and now United and Optum, looking at both insurance and also care delivery side. And we have, in fact, George Barrett, who is the former CEO of Cardinal, who in fact is a big supply chain. Then of course, we have the engagement of all the major players of hospitals, CEOs, CEOs of bio, pharma, and, of course, and also policy people, including Don Berwick and Liz Fowler from CMI and others. And we're coming together to say, how do we actually reach the goal of decarbonizing the US health sector, supporting President Biden's goal of 50% reduction in emission by 2030 and net neutral by 2050. And you know, as you can imagine, this is gonna be, you know, I would say a lot of hard work because we have to start thinking about how to measure each other, how to measure scope one, two, and three, how to report it, and how to actually have people agree that these are the measurements and then begin to set standards for ourselves to reach those goals. I won't take any more of your time because you may have questions for me. Suffice to say, area, and we're gonna do a lot more. In fact, if you do join the campaign uh, that we're gonna launch later on, I tell you, this is a $50 million campaign that we are launching. We have already got great staff. We're gonna add more staff. We obviously need more resources to enable us to move in this direction. We also work across the academies, engineering, other sciences, to make sure that this is a cross academy initiative as well. So let me stop here, Michelle and Jonathan, except to say, really, thank you. A heartfelt thank you. I can't thank you enough. This is so important to us. And by the way, the Presence Forum that I have set at the end of the day with Gina McCarthy kicking off is going to be all about the whole grand challenge. And please join us and help us guide us to say what we're missing, what we need to do. And also, you'd be very pleased if you look at the election results, a good number of people who are working in climate has been now part of this academy and they will help us drive, in fact, many of the changes. So thank you.
You're muted, Michelle. So I'll first say a quick thank you, Victor, for your incredible leadership. And that's why we're accelerating. Go ahead, Michelle. Uh, thank you, Victor. Um, I now have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, um, who is Paul Schramm. Paul is the climate science team lead with the Climate and Health Program at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. Paul coordinates the Climate and Health Program science activities and partnership and serves as the co-chair of the Federal Climate Change and Human Health Group. His work at the CDC focuses on the human health effects of climate change, including the impacts of heat waves, extreme weather events, and vector-borne diseases. He will be talking about heat, climate change, and health. And then, uh, leading the commentary after Paul's presentation, because we thought it would be nice, and Jin Jang. Um, Jonathan is the director, we're gonna have Jonathan Patz, who's the director of the Global Health Institute at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He served as the lead author for the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and co-chaired the Health Expert Panel, the US National Assessment on Climate Change. And as mentioned, he'll be leading the commentary on Dr. Schramm's presentation. Paul, can you share your screen now? Great, thank you, Michelle. Is that coming through? Looks great, looks great. All right, excellent. Well, thank you for that introduction. And it's great to be here and great to see this topic. Um, of course, I think it's incredibly important. So it's great to see um, growing and increasing interest in the health effects of climate change. Um, so at CDC, we have a climate health program that's been funded since 2009, and we work on a wide variety of climate hazards. But today in my brief presentation, I'm gonna focus on heat. So I'll start with just a, a very basic extreme heat summary. I'll talk about some populations that are disproportionately affected. And then I'll go into some of the work that uh, CDC has on heat, as well as some of the health departments and other partners that we work with. And I'll end with a few different resources that may be of use to you and your colleagues. So extreme heat has definitely been in the news a lot this year. Of course, we had the record-breaking heat wave in the Pacific Northwest and in Canada back in June and July. There were a number of heat waves in New England. Uh, the Olympics in Tokyo actually set a record as the hottest Olympics of all time. Um, and this is because heat waves are becoming worse. They're becoming more frequent. They're becoming hotter and they're becoming more intense. Um, so it's something that uh, is starting to enter uh, or be reflected in the media a lot more. Um, and of course, this has health impacts. So as climate change increases heat, we, we are seeing increased humidity, longer, more frequent heat waves. And the direct Im health impact of that is dehydration, heat stroke, um, and of course, unfortunately, death and mortality. Um, and this can affect anyone, but there are certain populations that are more impacted from extreme heat. And there's a list at the bottom of this slide of some of those. Um, I'll just mention a few outdoor workers, especially agricultural workers, and especially earlier in the year. So for example, if there's a heat wave in April, um, student athletes, um, also certain uh, medications, people taking beta blockers, for example, are more uh, impacted by exposure to extreme heat. And then of course, uh, as reflected by socioeconomic status, people without access to air conditioning. Um, so, so while heat can affect anybody, um, it certainly is certain communities and populations that are more disproportionately impacted by heat. Um, but it is a major health impact. There are more people that die from heat in the United States, for example, than from any other natural disaster um, like flooding or hurricanes. So I, I mentioned that people are disproportionately impacted. One way to look at that is by overlaying social vulnerability um, with exposure. So this is just an example from a study that one of my colleagues did looking specifically at cardiovascular mortality um, and using a vulnerability index, overlaying it with heat exposure at the county level. So this shows even on a geographical basis, there are, are parts of our country, um, of course, you could do this globally as well, but this study only looked at, at 48 states, uh, looking at which areas are at greatest risk. So studies like this are really important because as you all know, we have very limited resources in healthcare and in public health. 
and this helps to be able to target those resources um, to work with communities that are most impacted by heat and where the health outcomes are the greatest. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we do at CDC, as well as what some of our partners do. One thing that we do is surveillance. Um, we have to have a baseline. We have to know what's happening with heat. Um, so through our National Syndromic Surveillance Program, as well as a no number of other surveillance programs, uh, we do track a, a variety of health outcomes related to heat. On the left here, you can see an uh, MMWR that we published earlier this year on the Pacific Northwest heat wave. So this was looking at emergency department visits and near real time data. And we were able to track the deaths, or excuse me, the hospitalizations that were occurring in the Pacific Northwest um, during this heat wave. And that's what you can see with the black line on that uh, graph where even though the population in that region is much lower than in many other parts of the US, there was a huge spike in hospitalizations. Um, and then on the right is a, a paper published last year where we looked at uh, a baseline of long-term heat-related deaths throughout the United States. So it's really important to have systems in place that track what is happening with heat-related morbidity and mortality. So these are uh, important efforts that we have across CDC in collaboration um, with a variety of hospital systems and health departments. We also, in addition to surveillance, have grants uh, to help communities around the country prepare and respond to the health impacts of climate change. And this includes heat. So most of the jurisdictions that we fund through our Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative, as well as our Climate Ready Tribes and Territories Initiative, work on heat. Uh, so they don't have to work on heat. We actually have a framework to help them decide uh, what is of greatest impact in their community. So some are working on uh, flooding or wildfires, but almost all of them do work on heat because it is a problem uh, everywhere. Um, and uh, just a few examples that I'll mention here are that uh, Boston noticed that their messaging on heat wasn't getting out to certain communities that were at higher risk. So they did uh, translation of all of their materials into 10 different languages. An example from New York City, they launched a program called Be a Buddy, where they actually trained people to check in on their elderly neighbors during heat waves. Uh, another example was the state of Arizona, which we directly fund. Several counties within that state established heat relief networks, uh, including cooling centers. And then the state health department tracked and mapped those cooling centers and helps to, to share that information. So there's a lot more examples than this. Um, and these are just ones that CDC funded. Of course, there are a variety of cities, tribes, counties um, across our country and then internationally that are working on heat to help prevent those health impacts. And we, we do have more examples of that on our website if you'd like more information. So in addition to the surveillance and the, the direct funding of programs, we also uh, track a wide variety of data and make it publicly available. So this example that I'm showing is from CDC's National Environmental Public Health Tracking Portal, um, which hopefully most of you have, have heard of. There are a variety of environmental health metrics on this, um, but there is a whole section on climate change, and that includes quite a bit of information on heat. We have historical heat information at the county level. There is projected heat information from the National Climate Assessment, and then a wide variety of vulnerability metrics. Um, so you can map those side by side, you can graph them, you can download them. And just one example I have pulled up on the screen right now, uh, the map on the left is a vulnerability metric that is looking at a uh, number of extreme heat days. So that, that's really the exposure side of things. And then on the right is a percent of population over age 65 that lives alone. So you can kind of pair sensitivity and exposure. And again, this helps to show where uh, the greatest risk might be. Um, so there are a lot more metrics than just these two I'm showing here. There's a whole suite of heat indicators and heat exposures that are uh, publicly available at the county level. And in some cases, even the census track or the census block level. We also have the heat and health tracker, um, which is a, a more specific focus on heat, including on the communication side of things. 
Um, so if you just Google CDC heat and health tracker, this will come up. Um, it has uh, syndromic surveillance data. It also has projected temperatures for the next month. We actually worked with the National Weather Service to develop that forecast specifically for this purpose. Um, and it allows health departments to look at uh, what heat, uh, heat wave metrics will be for the forthcoming month. Again, to help them really look at um, if they need to be planning for it and, and where they should target their resources. And again, this is all the way down to a county level. I've pulled up a few graphics here from Douglas County, Nebraska, as an example, uh, that's Omaha. Uh, so it shows uh, risk factors and compares them to the national average. Um, and allows you to, to look at uh, current and forecasted heat data. And then that's paired with all of the resources that we have, as well as a variety of other heat resources to help with response. Um, so we continue to grow and expand the heat and health tracker. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is we do also have a variety of resources um, for communities, some of it aimed at the general public, um, some aimed at health departments and, and their partners. And there are just a few shown here. Uh, we've done some of those with FEMA, with EPA, um, with uh, NOAA, uh, and all of those, the, the three listed here, as well as quite a few others are available on our uh, resources webpage. Uh, so please uh, give that a, a look if you'd like to see any of these. Um, so that's just a, a quick overview of the health impacts of heat, how climate change is, is affecting it, um, and then some of the data and resources that we have to help communities respond. Uh, so um, with that, I'll turn it over to Jonathan. Paul, oh, thank you uh, so much uh, for your presentation. You know, just you mentioned Tokyo's record heat uh, for the Olympics. Uh, it reminds me of the, the late Kirk Smith published a paper uh, and found that by the year 2085, only eight, of four, uh, only eight of 543 cities outside of Western Europe would have temperatures and the ability to have an Olympics because of you know, the exhaustion that happens with internal heat generated from a marathon and, and competing in Olympics. Um, you know, one of your first slides, you talked about, um, you know, extreme heat is in the news. And I'm reminded that uh, at the same time, uh, not only did we have extreme heat, but we had droughts and fires, which we're going to hear in the next session. And we also saw record flooding in Europe and in China. So I'd like to just share a uh, slide with, uh, to remind us. Okay, so does it, do you see a slide up okay? Yes, Jonathan. Yes, so uh, that we really, you know, I wanna just hammer my key point, which would be that, um, that we need to, hang on, let me just put it in there. Is that bigger? Yeah, yeah. Good, good. You know, that as we see these headlines of these extreme events, you know, we're now able to, focus a little bit more on the root cause of them. And as we know, climate change increases the probability of these extremes. And it used to be that you'd say, well, you know, you can't tell if that extreme event was climate change or not. But now uh, with this new World Weather Attribution Initiative across many institutes, um, that they're able to statistically look at an extreme event and um, their conclusion of that heat dome that you talked about in the Northwest was that it was virtually impossible to have that extreme event without human-induced climate change. And statistically, today's one degree centigrade average warming above pre-industrial levels increased the likelihood of that event by 150-fold. So we're able to you know, begin to look at the, the root causes. And I think that we should and must really have side by side with a heat event like that, you know, the headline of what's causing it and what's behind it. Um, I wanna just focus lastly, and then I'll, I'll stop. And then we want questions. Uh, put your questions in the chat, please. You're, you showed the, the heat related uh, social vulnerability uh, map. And I just wanna drill down on, on that just by showing one example of why it's so important uh, to look at this and recognize 
uh, that equity is one of the key aspects of the risks of climate of the climate crisis. Drilling down here in Phoenix, this is uh, uh, the heat, looking at uh, the urban heat island and across Phoenix, and that's the poverty map. Heat, poverty, and you just see them. And I just wanted to, to drill down on that as an example uh, that you had um, brought up as, as so important as far as social uh, the, the social aspect of this. So those are my key, key points reflecting on your wonderful presentation, you know, to really let's bring in the cause. We, we don't want to be mopping up the, the mess on the floor without thinking about turning off the faucet, a stitch in, nine, in time stays nine, all that stuff. We really need to uh, be including the upstream causal issue of, of climate change as we see these uh, record-breaking events uh, un, un, unravel and, and be in the news. So with that, uh, we are open for questions and please put your questions in the chat. And Andrea, do you wanna, Andrea Baccarelli, do you wanna start? You wanna unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, By the way, very interesting. I, go ahead. Thank you. Very interesting that uh, I wrote the question before seeing the slide of uh, work in incredible work. I mean, it strikes to me that the cities that have grown the most in the United States in the past 10 years uh, are uh, in the areas that are particularly hot. So I want to ask how much that uh, impacts the heat mortality. And Phoenix, I think, is the city that's grown the most in the past five years. And also, I mean, uh, what type of uh, measures we can think about in terms of uh, adapting to heat uh, as the cities grow, as this, uh, especially new developments uh, are built, or whether there is any way to become wiser and convince people that uh, it's not the time to move in the Did everybody? Uh -huh. Yeah, and I can see it written. You you yeah. cut out a little bit, Andrea, but I can see what you you wrote um, as well in the chat. And and it it sounds like the question is kind of we have growing populations in area that have high levels of heat, such as Phoenix, Arizona, um, and and how is that impacting risk and mortality? And uh, it's it's quite a complicated question because it is true a lot of the growth, especially if you look just in the U.S., are in areas that experience very extreme heat. Um, one thing I will say is that our adaptive capacity has really grown over the, the past few decades. Uh, you know, if you look at the, the Chicago heat wave in uh, the 1990s or in uh, the European heat wave in uh, 2003, um, communities weren't really prepared for it. And now I won't say we're prepared, but more and more, um, especially with uh, funding over the last decade, communities are starting to become more prepared. There are uh, cooling centers. There are programs to help people pay their electricity bills so that they can run air conditioning. Um, so it, it certainly is a, a higher risk as more people move in into warm areas. Um, but we also have higher capacity there than we have in the past. Uh, but then there are there's a big threat there with compounding hazards. So what happens, for example, if there's a major heat wave in Phoenix and the power goes out? and you don't have air conditioning, uh, that would be a huge public health disaster. Um, another thing I'll say, part of your, your question as you wrote it out was about um, increasing in, in heat mortality. Um, we're actually per capita, at least in the United States, not seeing an increase. And I think that is uh, in large part due to the capacity that's been built. Um, it is in the news more, people pay more attention to it. Health departments are preparing for it. There are more cooling centers than there ever were. Um, so it, it's really hard to measure that exact effect because you don't really have a good counter example either, you know, that the city, they don't not put cooling centers in one community in order to see what happens, you know? So uh, luckily, I, I think some of the health impact that we could be having from heat is being avoided by all the great work that health departments have been doing. Thank you, Andrea and Paul. Uh, next up is uh, Stan Berman. Do you wanna ask your question? And then Elvis, you're on deck. Yes, my question is a simple one. Um, we have a very long border with Mexico uh, and I was curious if CDC was able to coordinate with Mexican counterparts uh, particularly in the northern Mexican states that border the United States, and if there could be some 
sharing of technology, sharing of epidemiologic uh, strategies so that we could have a, a wider swath uh, of uh, information to benefit people in both countries. Sure. Thanks. Great, great question. And I can only speak for the climate health program at CDC. We haven't done much of that. We, we did have coordinated with Mexico in the past as part of a North American climate health group. Um, we, I don't think we've worked specifically with them on heat. Uh, we have worked with Health Canada specifically on heat, um, but I think that's a good point. That's something especially um, some of the border states who might be experiencing heat wave at the same time as some of the northern Mexican states, uh, there certainly is a chance to share best practices and uh, epi data for that. Elvis Paul, you want to unmute? Yes, um, thank you very much, Paul. Um, my name's Hick. Um, um, so, yeah, you, you talk about heat waves, and we um, learned this year, or was it last year, that the heat waves from the Sahel actually moved and affected uh, the US right down to, I think, uh, Florida or one of the states. So, I, I wonder what, uh, how your program is looking at, at the issues. You know, and uh, I think it will be interesting to see whether you have any collaborative work going on uh, between maybe CDC US and CDC Africa. In fact, I'm sitting uh, in the CDC uh, Africa CDC building here at the Africa Union. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks for that question. Um, and that that's an area I would love to um, expand and grow in. Right now, our program is funded yearly by Congress, and it is a domestic program. So our specific funding is for adaptation within the United States. Um, so that doesn't mean we can't work internationally. We're just not specifically funded for it. Um, so I think there's definitely a role, not just for CDC, um, but across the U.S. government to, to work on some of these international collaborations. Um, because this is a problem everywhere. And as you said, uh, weather patterns and climatology in one place affect other places. Uh, so uh, that's another area that I would hope to grow in and, and expand our international collaboration. Paul, oh, thank you very much. And Elvis, thanks for that. So uh, we are about out of time, except that since you mentioned international, Paul, if I can uh, ask the very last question and then introduce the next speaker. Um, you know, the president's budget would increase CDC's funding in climate and health by tenfold. Uh, what are the plans for scaling up CDC's effort in this area? Sure. So we, we are absolutely working on that, and we don't have finalized publicly available plans yet. But what I will say relevant to that is I'm within the National Center for Environmental Health, which is the only place that has received climate and health funding in the past. Now we are working very closely with uh, CDC's uh, Center for Global Health and trying to tie into the, the work that they're doing. We now have a CDC-wide climate and health task force with over 140 people participating. Um, we've developed strategies and mission and vision, and I think it'll really help us to expand the work globally because other centers within CDC do have a global mission and they might already be doing they are doing some climate relevant things international. And I think this will help us to make it uh, more intentional and actually bring funding to that. Thank you very much, Paul. And thanks for your questions, everyone. So we're gonna move to the next panel uh, and I'm gonna introduce the two, uh, the speaker and our comment, commenter, commentator. Uh, Carrie, Dr. Carrie Nadeau is the Natasee Foundation Endowed Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics and the director of the Sean N. Parker Center for Allergy and Asthma Research at Stanford University. Uh, Dr. Nadeau is one of the globe's foremost experts in adult and pediatric allergy, immunology, and asthma, and how these are impacted by environmental, immune, and genetic factors. Um, Carrie, we uh, will be talking about wildfires uh, impact on health. So Carrie, I turn this over. Oh, wait, but then uh, following Carrie, uh, Phil, uh, Professor Phil Landrigan will be uh, uh, providing comment. And he's the director of the Program for Global Public Health and the Common Good. He's also the director of the Global Pollution Observatory at Boston University, uh, I'm sorry, at Boston College, BC. 
Uh, he is world renowned for his work on pediatric environmental health and recently led a Lancet Commission report on pollution and health, as well as a Monaco Commission on Human Health and Ocean Pollution. Dr. Landrigan will be providing the commentary uh, after uh, Dr. Nadell's presentation and opening the Q&A. So over to you, Carrie, on wildfires. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. It's a pleasure to be among the NAM and I'll be talking about wildfires and their impact on human health. I want to show you this video, which is particulate matter 2.5 microns or less that exists when wildfires uh, expose us to the consequences of their toxins. This is one of many pollutants in wildfires. Today, I'll be talking about why wildfires are increasing, what is actually in wildfire smoke, what levels of wildfire smoke do we get exposed to, and then what are the health consequences of short-term and long-term exposures to wildfire? And then finally, how can we mitigate harm? What can we do to help our patients and communities? So as you know, in the West and all around the world, there's no longer just one fire season. Due to climate change and increased temperatures, we're seeing a rise in wildfires around the world. And for example, this is the wildfire extent in the United States plotted out over years on the y-axis as the area is burned in millions of acres. And unfortunately, this is due to increase and with the intensity of the fires that we're seeing, for example, in the West, we have up to a football field being burned per second. And this leads to disastrous consequences. For example, the 2017 Paradise Fire in California had a plan in which people were supposed to evacuate to the hospital, but unfortunately the hospital is one of the first buildings to burn in the Paradise Fire. In addition, when we think about other issues that are developing in wildfires and how to best promote education, people need to understand that air quality indices over 100, for example, with vulnerable populations and children where they breathe more air per pound of body weight, they are particularly at risk for the health consequences of wildfires. And in addition, this little girl pictured has the wrong mask on that we need to also explain and educate but what filters work and what filters don't work. But what's actually in wildfires? Well, we've been taking samples among many other groups and the chemistry is showing that wildfire smoke is 10 times as toxic as air pollution. And they're not wild anymore. This includes burning of residences, commercial buildings, as well as vehicles. And so we explain wildfire in the same data collection system as air pollution, as particulate matter. And for example, 100 AQI is equal to 35 micrograms per meters cube of particulate matter. And to put that into perspective, 22 AQI is similar to smoking one cigarette. And unfortunately, not just particulate matter is emitted from wildfires, but also carbon monoxide, ozone, nitric oxide, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, volatile organic compounds. And often these are not seen and they're not filtered out appropriately either by common filters. And what's worse is that there are soot balls in the air pictured here. And those soot balls basically blanket the atmosphere and create even more trapping of greenhouse gases and warming of the atmosphere. So climate change is affecting wildfires, but wildfires are worsening climate change. And when vehicles and buildings burn, we see a release of hydrogen cyanide, hydrochloric acid, phosgene, heavy metals like arsenic, lead, and cadmium, microplastics pictured here in our sample of wildfire smoke recently in California, toluene, styrene, dioxins, and detergents. And you can see here in a video that was mapped from July this year from our fires in California, the extent to which the smoke travels so quickly to parts thousands of miles away. And there's really no safe distance from wildfire smoke. And unfortunately, when the smoke circumnavigates the earth, the only thing that can actually drop it to the ground is rain, and then it gets in the, into the water supply. So when we think about the way to relatively explain to our patients and communities how much they are being exposed to for wildfires, we need to really think about revising this scale because many of our fires are now even going over 300 AQI. In addition, this table only protects us from particulate matter, as it were. We also need to explain it in terms of the gases that are unseen and not filtered. And then finally, and very importantly, the social determinants of health, vulnerable populations, comorbid conditions, 
need to be incorporated into how we mitigate and how we manage wildfire exposure. And importantly, wildfire smoke affects all parts of the human body. What you can't see or smell can actually harm you. Many publications have now been published on how wildfire smoke affects the human physiology, not just the lungs, but that is very powerful in their inflammation induction and in the lung epithelium. And also once those small particles and gases get into the bloodstream, that activates cardiovascular effects with heart attacks and stroke, premature births, asthma rates, as well as diabetes chronically, other autoimmune disorders. And then finally, importantly, is lower cognition in the brain. And when people suffer from wildfires, it induces a lot of stress. There's a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder now in people that have been exposed in their communities to wildfires. And there's displacement and loss that we need to make sure that we address. So what do we call short-term exposures and what are some of the health consequences? Short-term is defined as one day to one month after a wildfire exposure and all cause mortality, many organ specific outcomes are possibly associated with wildfire exposures. For example, here in California, we're doing studies in South Lake Tahoe where the Caldor fire recently burned for more than 60 days with over 15 days of 350 plus AQI. This is where the community was about 30 miles distance from the fires, but even within the first two days, we saw a dramatic increase in asthma, heart attacks, and stroke. But that's just not in California. In Indonesia, for example, in Singapore, where there's burning of peat moss and forests in Indonesia, and Singapore is over 700 miles away, they're seeing increases in ER visits even in the first two to four days after the wildfires start in Indonesia. And overall, there's much evidence showing that in four years and younger, asthma is increased by about 20% in areas that are exposed to wildfire smoke. In ages 65 years and older, heart attacks increase by up to 40% and strokes increase by up to 15%. But importantly, it's not just about age. Vulnerable populations also include those of low socioeconomic status. Environmental justice is a major issue in post-wildfire recovery in communities due to decreased access to healthcare and to safety. What about long-term exposure? There's less research in this. There are areas of the country that we study, for example, in the Central Valley that, for example, have increased their days per year of smoky days by up to 225%. In the Central Valley, they have over 60 days per year exposed to AQIs of over 100. And this is about 150 miles distance from the fire. What about Brazil? In Sao Paulo, they're about 2,000 miles away from the fires and the rainforest, and they spend over 240 days per year at 200 plus AQI. Firefighters' lifespan is reduced by 10 years, and they serve as the best example of a population that has been exposed to chronic wildfire. And this is even controlled for other variables. And you can see here from this publication by Navarro et al, that the relative risk of lung cancer has increased by about over 1.4. We luckily just received a grant from the NHLBI, one of the first of its kind, to be able to study the long-term effects of wildfire exposure uh, across the lifespan. So what can we do to advise our patients and help mitigate harm to communities? This is a great article that was published by the New England Journal. Personal actions can make a difference. For example, relocation. However, that might not be feasible, especially for vulnerable populations. We can close doors and set air conditioners to recirculation mode. However, that also might not be possible depending on the age of the house and the ability to buy those filters. We can stay indoors and avoid heavy and prolonged physical activity, but that's also impractical for outdoor workers. Then finally, wearing a face mask can help us mitigate the risk of PM 2.5 exposure, but not necessarily to gases, and they're not necessarily suitable for children. N95 masks have just started to be produced for children. So beyond personal mitigation, we need to think about policy changes and really be advocates and study these policy changes. My colleagues at the Woods Institute have an example that was published in PNAS this year of modeling the burden of wildfire and how policy changes can mitigate their effects on healthcare. And this is an example of three different models of exposures and mortality to PM 2.5 from wildfires over 100,000 
individuals per year, just looking at the age of 65 and over and the additional premature births, excuse me, premature deaths that would occur if we didn't do anything about climate change. And importantly is to look at if we could reduce emissions from smoke, if we can go upstream, as Dr. Katz mentioned, and reduce climate change by changing emission and reductions of fossil fuels, you can see how much that will improve and decrease the rate of premature deaths in at least those populations over 65 years of age. So in summary, what I've spoken about today is that wildfire chemical makeup and toxic levels depends on materials and temperature, oxygenation, and ventilation. PM 2.5 from wildfires associated with inflammation induced respiratory and cardiovascular effects, but more needs to be studied for the other pollutants in wildfire smoke. Climate change increases wildfire events and wildfires enhance the effects of global climate change. This is a vicious circle. More interdisciplinary global research is needed to study the acute and chronic effects of wildfires on personal and public health and especially in health economics. Vulnerable populations are at risk. Environmental justice issues need to be addressed. And with increases in wildfires likely in the future, there are ways to mitigate and adapt at the individual level public health level, local, country, and global levels via education, training, emergency preparedness plans, policy changes in global warming and fossil fuel emissions, and we can be advocates and be prepared to engage. There is a need to prevent and manage wildfires and thereby decrease health risks via land use management, prescribed burns, and agricultural economic frameworks. I want to thank you for inviting me here today and for the NAM and all of the people involved in this research that I've presented. Thank you. Phil, take it away. Thank, Thank you, Michelle. Carrie. Here we go. Thank you for a great presentation, Carrie. And as Phil is sharing his screen, please put chat questions in the chat. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Carrie, for a lovely talk. Um, let me offer some reflection on your talk and specifically talk about how climate change and pollution are changing patterns of non-communicable diseases and what this means for clinical practice in the United States and in countries around the world. One of the great triumphs of both public health and medicine in the last half century is this enormous decline in age standardized mortality from heart disease, uh, more than 75% combination of public health interventions and medical interventions. Typically, when we think about the driving factors behind that decline, we think of the risk factors that were identified through the Framingham Heart Study, the Alameda County Heart Study, the other big longitudinal studies that I've listed here, especially tobacco uh, use hypertension and diet and nutrition. But as Carrie has so beautifully illustrated, there's another big, highly preventable risk factor for cardiovascular disease, chronic obstructive lung disease, lung cancer, diabetes, and other non-communicable diseases that is often overlooked. And this is pollution. Carrie's talked about pollution from wildfires, there's pollution from industry, there's pollution from motor vehicles, this pollution from toxic chemicals whose manufacture is increasing exponentially around the world. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to think about the fact that in those same 50 years that mortality from cardiovascular disease was declining and we were doing a better job of managing hypertension, reducing cigarette smoking, uh, prescribing Lipitor for elevated uh, cholesterol, we also saw a 70% reduction in air pollution that followed passage of the Clean Air Act. We saw a 95% reduction in airborne lead pollution. We now know that lead can increase both uh, risk of both heart disease and kidney disease down to extremely low levels. So one unresolved question is what precisely has been the contribution of pollution control to declines in non-communicable disease mortality. That'd be an interesting question to answer historically because it points the way for the future. What's the contribution of pollution to chronic disease mortality today? And, and what's going to happen in the future 
if we don't if we don't get on top of the of the twin tightly conjoined problems of climate change and pollution. Well, from 28 from 2015 to 2018, as uh, Jonathan mentioned, I had the privilege to co-chair the Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health. We found that pollution is responsible for nine million deaths around the world each year. We found that pollution is the inevitable com concomitant of climate change. The fossil fuel combustion is the major root cause of both of them. Uh, 70% of the 9 million deaths that are caused by pollution are due to non-communicable diseases. A quarter of all stroke deaths, a quarter of all cardiovascular deaths, and 35% of, of stroke deaths. In the United States, the best recent estimate published a few months ago in JAMA estimates that pollution is responsible for about 200,000 deaths per year, uh, two thirds of them from cardiovascular disease. So it's obviously many fewer deaths than it would have been in the absence of pollution control, but it's still a big number. And it's interesting to note um, that our Lancet Commission on the Trump Commission that Stephanie Woolhandler and David Himmelstein led, published in the Lancet a few months ago, actually found that when pollution controls in this country were relaxed during the past four year administration, cardiovascular deaths due to pollution actually increased. So the reduction in pollution is not inevitable. It, it's something we have to work at. So what's the take home lesson here? Firstly, physicians, nurses, all of us who care for patients have to add pollution to our usual list of CBD risk factors in addition to tobacco, uh, exercise, lipids, hypertension. We need to add pollution, take a brief history of pollution exposure, assess susceptibility, Carrie's chart, uh, the, the multicolored red, green, yellow, blue chart showed how important susceptibility is, but anticipatory guidance tailored to individual patients. And we need to advocate. You know, physicians have been powerfully successful advocates in the past. Uh, dealing with existential issues that confront our society. My favorite example is the IPPNW, the International Physicians Against Nuclear War, led by Bernard Lau, who 50 years ago basically persuaded the leaders of the United States and the Soviet Union to back away from the brink of nuclear disaster. I think we in the health professions have a responsibility to do the same today in the face of climate change, in the face of pollution, we have to work in our own houses, in our hospitals, in our healthcare facilities to reduce pollution, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we have to advocate across society for a ma massive and rapid transition to non polluting renewable energy, which, by the way, does not mean nuclear energy. And uh, we recently developed a chart, it's going to be published in a few weeks in the Royal Journal, laying out a roadmap for both individual level actions as well as societal level actions for preventing uh, chronic disease caused by pollution. And uh, here's a peek into the future. So with that, I'll close it out. And uh, Jonathan, back to you for questions. I think we, um, since we're running late, Jonathan, uh, should we move on? I don't see any specific questions. There are a lot. Oh. There's a lot of comments about greening. Right. Well, if I could ask. Go ahead. One question to both speakers about, you know, the striking increased uh, toxicity of wildfire smoke. It really, uh, if you were to say one thing, uh, I know, Carrie, you're, you had lots of reasons for wildfire smoke being so toxic, but what would be the lesson or the, what you'd like the uh, journalist to know about why wildfire smoke, if you were to say one thing, why it's so much worse than we realize, what would you say? I think it's worse because the heat is so intense and more than just forests are being burned. Okay, yeah, that's a good answer, great. But I'm going to move us on because we're running over. <laughs> this is a very packed session. Um, but again, please, people put in their questions in the chat. I'm going to introduce Elvis Paul Pangam. Um, and he's coming to us from Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. 
Um, and just to remind people, Africa, along with other great other areas of the global south, bears some of the world's gravest climate consequences, often creating um, really creating displacement of people who have become known as climate refugees. Many of the continent's communities are more vulnerable due to less developed water and sanitation infrastructure, weaker health systems, and various other structural legacies of colonialism. What's especially critical is involving local thinkers and leaders in conducting research, sharing knowledge, and co-designing solutions. Thus, we're very grateful to have Dr. Elvis Paul Tangham here with us talking about drought, its impact on health in Africa, and the Great Green Wall Initiative. Um, this is an initiative um, that is, the, he's the coordinator for the Africa Union Commissioned. And it's focused on building resilience in the dry lands of Africa through sustainable land management, restoration, and economic development. Um, Elvis Paul, please take it over. Thank you very much, um, uh, Paul. Uh, I'll share my screen now. Am I there? Um, yes, you're there. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, and I'm very privileged and feel very uh, proud, for lack of a better word, to be among uh, the best of the best. And uh, yes, um, and I'm calling from the Africa Union Commission in Addis Ababa, where we, we sit. Yeah, so uh, my discussion this evening is, is about um, um, it's about uh, looking at the impacts of, of health on on on, on the uh, adjacent uh, uh, population, and we we'll also look at the issues of the Great Green Wall, impacts of drought, and how um, uh, the Great Green Wall was created by the Africa Union to um, uh, to uh, mitigate some of these impacts. And so when we talk about drought uh, uh, in Africa, or generally drought um, uh, has been a very serious cause on the world. Drought is a very serious issue all over the world. You know, the devastating uh, uh, impact of it, um, um, decades on has caused more than 11 million deaths and directly affect millions of people. They say 2 billion people are affected. And uh, the impact of job uh, seriously hurts economy. Uh, all economies in the world say it's costing about um, $10 billion annually. And Africa is particularly, particularly very vulnerable to drought. If you look at statistics shows that uh, in the last year, we've had about 84 drought incidents in more than eight, uh, 30 countries, notably in the Sahel region, uh, which um, uh, you can see the Sahel region is uh, the part, uh, the yellow, the yellowish uh, uh, part, and this extends right down um, uh, to the um, uh, to the Horn of Africa. And as we, we know about the Sahel, which is this 3.5 million kilometers uh, ecoclimatic about that west region, it stretched all over the whole Africa, 3.5 billion uh, and uh, million uh, kilometers. And, Elvis. Elvis, your slides are not advancing. Um, you might want to try to advance, or can we have the Academy advance it for Dr. Tengam? Oh, it's not okay. Sure, I'll pull them up right now. Jose, can you do that for him? Sure, I'll pull him up. I think he's two slides behind. Yeah. Thank you. Keep going, okay. Dr. Tengam. Is he doing it? Yes. Uh, okay. It'll it'll happen momentarily. Yeah, so I will keep on going and catch up. So it, I think the internet is a bit slow from this end. And uh, one of the focus, the area that I'm looking at is uh, is the Sahel, which is the most vulnerable areas uh, that have been largely badly uh, uh, affected by the impacts of, of climate change and drought um, uh, in Africa. And here we have about four types of drought in Africa, which we talk about the meteorological drought, the hydrological drought, the agricultural drought, and also the socioeconomic uh, uh, drought. And recurrent drought in uh, sub-Saharan Africa has caused extensive damage. The high seasonality of the rainfall, the number of people exposed, and the vulnerability of their societies and economics 
this geographical area very vulnerable. And you can see the, 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 the uh, Sahel precipitation from uh, 1900 to 2011. You, you see the drastic drop. The upper part shows um, uh, areas of flourishing rainfall. But you realize that from the 60s, from mid 16s hours to the 70s, there have been uh, um, a drastic drop, drop in, in the amount of rainfall. Uh, which has caused uh, led to a lot of drought and with other dire consequences in the region. And uh, one of the, the, the classical examples of drought in Africa, I don't know whether you are seeing this slide. We is are. This illustration of the Lake Chad region. If you look at the Lake Chad region from 1963 up to 2007, you realize that this very important water body has lost about 94% of its uh, uh, water. And we are talking about an area that, uh, that uh, has about, uh, today we're talking about 40, 30 to 40 million inhabitants among all these countries of Nigeria, Chad, uh, Niger, Cameroon, and part of the Central Africa Republic. And this is a classical example of what drought has done in Africa over the, the last uh, uh, centuries. And these have been seriously exacerbated by climate change and the caprices of nature. And so some of the causes of drought, you know, uh, that are in this area is, we know about land, uh, land use and land use change, we know about air circulation, especially with the El Nino and La Nina phenomenon. We know about the depletion of, of moisture and, and the, the huge uh, uh, demand and supply of water changes More in death streams and local landscapes, deforestation, land use, and land use changes. So these are all different uh, uh, causes of, of drought in Africa. And drought and desertification is huge and it has badly, badly affected the, the, the adjacent uh, population in this area in many ways than one. If you look at these images, which are real images that we took, you will see it clearly depicts some of the challenges of, of, of land degradation, drought, and desertification. And all of these are linked together, and all of them are exacerbated by climate change. You know, and here we're talking about extreme weather, we talk about land degradation, issues mixed up with population growth, lack of infrastructure, and everything that you can think of. And the impact has been huge. Farming, hunger, malnutrition, exodus, increase in natural resource conflict. And now we have the new phenomenon of extremism, terrorism, arms trafficking, and long-term vulnerability. So, it is huge in, in, the, uh, in, in the whole of Africa, especially in the Sahel. And so one of the things that we really have to look at is the impact of drought on health. And this is an area that has literally gone under the blanket. It is not talked about. When you talk about drought, the focus is on the physical, what we are seeing on the land and on the fact that the natural resources of the land is being reduce, but there are both direct uh, impacts of drought and indirect impacts of drought, of climate change, as uh, of drought, as you can see uh, from this um, uh, diagram. Here, you can look at direct impact, which leads to the water shortages that lead to nutrition, lead to especially mental health. We have vector bone diseases, airborne diseases with issues to do with dust, as was shown um, uh, um, uh, during the, the presentation on, on uh, heat and also on, on wildfires. We have other related um, uh, um, uh, health uh, challenges like mobility. We have uh, waterborne diseases. And one Dr. Of Pengen, the... you may want to advance slides. Just tell Jose when to advance slides. OK, Jose, can you, can you go on now? Okay, uh, can you, I, I'm an, I just advanced it. Can you just confirm that that's the one that you're looking at, the one that says impacts of land degradation? I, I'm looking at impacts of drought on health. 
Next one. Next one. Go ahead. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yes, and one of the biggest uh, health impacts that is linked to drought is the issue of malaria, what we call paludisme in, 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 in French. And you realize that when, when drought reduces the amount of water that is found in these areas, and what happens is that it leads to standing water, and this is the best um, uh, um, uh, ecosystem that the anopheles uh, mosquitoes and other forms of mosquitoes really want. And so the incident, increased incidence of, of malaria, which caused millions of deaths in Africa annually, is, is uh, the issues that are related to drought. So I'm on the next uh, part of, of uh, the impacts. And then we also have uh, uh, the issues of drought related to food and nutrition. We have issues of drought to do with issues of, of air quality. We have the issues of sanitation and hygiene because when there is absence of water, there is a complete breakdown of the health and the hygiene um, uh, systems, which leads to serious issues of which we have the dysentery, we have the diarrhea, we have all of these things that occurs because of the lack of, because of drought, which leads to lack of water. And one of the biggest, biggest health issues that are related to drought is the mental health issues, mental illness. If you look at the Sahel, if you go to Northern Nigeria, Northern Burkina Faso, you will realize that there are so many people that are, that are, are affected by mental health. Mental health is a big uh, issue and drought desertification is directly linked to this, um, uh, to this issue because when people lost everything because of drought, when people lost their livelihood, when people lost their income generation, when people are forced to migrate, when people are affected by, by a natural resource related conflict, there's the big, big emotional challenges that leads to, um, uh, to a, a psychological and mental health. And this leads also to consumption of drugs, drug consumption, and I'm talking about very poor quality drugs is the biggest uh, challenge in this area, especially among the youth population who have lost everything. So drought is a huge, huge problem in, uh, in the dry lands of Africa, especially. But- Next slide. It is, it is, yes, now I'm on the Great Green World uh, introduction. And it is because of these impacts of drought desertification which has seriously been exacerbated by climate change that the African leaders came together to develop what today is called the Great Green World uh, uh, Initiative or the Great Green World for the Sahara and Sahel. If you look at the map uh, here, you will see the yellow areas which depicts the dry lands of Africa. And when you look at the, the topmost uh, areas and then there is the middle part which shows you the Sahara Desert. Down the yellow part you found, you can see the Sahel and right down to the Horn of Africa and right down to the, the Southern Africa region where we have the Kalahari and the Namib Desert. These are all areas that are very prone to drought. As we speak, Madagascar, Namibia, Angola are seriously being impacted by drought, leaving tens of millions of people hungry. And so this is how the Great Green War came about when the, 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 the heads of state of the continent analyzed the situation and said, look, we need to have an overarching policy response that is going to bring all of us, all the member states of the African Union together to work on these issues of desertification, drought, and to be resilient of the adjacent population to climate change. And so this is how the Great Green World came about. And since its inception, the Great Green Wall have been implemented. Now we are going into 35 uh, member states. We are looking at, at um, uh, the, all the issues of drought and desertification that we're talking about. We are putting in all the systems, both policy and, and bringing all our partners together, all the development partners, including the World Bank, the, the European Union, and all of uh, our international development partners. We are working with them on this. 
and also the great framework was created to also leverage on the huge potential that exists in the in the dry lands of Africa because most of the poverty is structural is because of lack of investment if you see the the the, the, um, uh, the slide here you will see that this is an area of huge huge uh, um, uh, uh, natural resource both uh, on the ground and off ground if you look at the the renewable energy potential of the of this uh, dry lands of Africa. Most of them have more than 14 hours of, of sunshine. They, 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 they have some of the youngest populations and they are very innovative. They are developing indigenous knowledge to cope with all what is happening. So the, the Great Green War was also uh, 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 built to ensure that we leverage the, the economic investment potential of this region. And so these are the objectives, improve the living condition and be the resilience of the people and biodiversity to climate change, drought, desertification, to do advocacy and to raise funds uh, to undertake these activities. So the guiding principles is looking at leveraging on existing uh, uh, experience, looking at South-South cooperation, of course, North-South cooperation, and getting to, to, to work with the local population to ensure that what we are doing respond to their um, uh, areas of interest. And most of our areas of interest is about resilience, is about adaptation and mitigation uh, of climate change. <clears throat> and we, get, we have uh, this as uh, what we call the civil pastoral uh, systems approach, where we look at the, the, the issues of pastoralism because this area, especially in the Sahel, provides 60% of, of the, the, um, the animals that are consumed on the continent. So we civil pastoral systems are very important for all agroforestry, forestry, afforestation, conservation, agriculture is very important. Are things that we do, tourism, especially natural and cultural tourism, renewable energy, and capacity building. And one of the biggest issues that we are handling now is wildfires. Wildfires is huge in Africa. So we are building capacity. We are trying to use uh, data and innovation in this. And it is, this one is, uh, this slide is here. I say, how much will land restoration cost in Africa? It is huge, but it's not as huge as the absence of undertaking land restoration. And so for you to restore, and, one hectare of land, you need about 44 uh, to, to, to $500 per hectare per year. This sounds very, very huge. But I use this example of the FIFA World Cup. The FIFA World Cup that is coming up in, in Qatar stands at more than, today stands at more than $300 billion for a one month show. Because I brought this because many people will say, oh, it's really expensive. I say it's not expensive. So I just showed that there is a lot of money and there's a need for a, a paradigm change and the need to shift our focus from, thing, from things that are not so important to things that are existential threat to our very, uh, uh, to our world. And these are some of the examples. If you can see this picture about the accomplishment or the achievement of the Great Green World, you see that we are introducing appropriate technology because these people usually will do uh, restorations with their hands. We are introducing uh, appropriate technology, introducing tractors. We are bringing in capacity building, especially focused on the women that bear the brunt of all of this um, uh, hard work. And we are also looking at issues to do with renewable energy, we are introducing um, a serious, uh, um, uh, what we call a program with the Africa Development Bank, which is called uh, Desert to Energy, where we are introducing uh, solar, wind, and thermal energy uh, in, in these communities. We are also uh, focusing on the uh, development of, of uh, development of value chains, looking at small farmer holders, bringing in all kinds of, of support to them. And also looking at issues to do with conflict, 
the biggest problem now in that region is the natural resource-based access and use conflict, where we have farmer grazier fighting on the patches of land that has remained from the whole land that is being degraded and affected by drought. Dr. Tangum, I'm going to ask yes. you to wrap up at the last slide because we have. Yes, this is the last slide, which, which is my conclusion. Yeah. So the conclusion is here is that the harmful effects of drought have been well defined and explored in meteorology, hydrology, agriculture, and economics. But very, very uh, little um, uh, um, uh, studies have been done about impact, the health impact of drought, especially in Africa. The, 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 the uh, data is still very, very scarce. And so there's an urgent need for us to look at the issues of the uh, research into the impact of health uh, of drought. And also, if we look at um, uh, what is happening now, what we are saying is that nature-based solutions and ecosystem services are the main, it should be the main focus that we are going to use to um, uh, make sure that we, we look uh, for lasting solutions when it comes to issues to do with drought, when it comes to issues to do with climate change and desertification. And we conclude by saying that the, the outbreak of the COVID pandemic and the fact that it was purportedly linked to zoonotic origin has shown us that our link between uh, nature and man is, is dysfunctional. So there's a high need for us to focus, to learn from this and to get uh, uh, things done and to focus on nature-based solutions because that is the only way we can have uh, everlasting and sustainable solutions to the issues of drought and uh, other uh, uh, climate change, wildfires and all the, the, the challenges that we have today. So thank you very much and uh, I have some of uh, some materials on the Great Green Wall uh, uh, on, the, on the slide. So thank you very much for Thank you very much, um, Elvis Paul. That was a wonderful description of what's happening in the global south um, and how no person needs to be left behind because these are very vulnerable populations. And speaking about vulnerable populations, um, I'm going to switch over now. And please put any questions to Dr. Tangum in, in the chat. But I'm going to switch over to um, David Hayes, who can talk to us about the vulnerable populations in the United States, um, because we are also um, facing this vulnerability. Um, we thought it was important to update, especially with what's going on with the current bills um, with the Biden administration around climate and clean energy. So I, we invited David Hayes, as special, who's special assistant to the president for climate policy. Um, at the White House. Um, just to let people know who David Hayes is, he served both pre Presidents Obama and Clinton as the Deputy Secretary and Chief Operating Officer of the Department of Interior. And during his tenure as, Depart as Deputy Secretary, Secretary, he led the department's climate change related activities, including all those renewable energy and the Interior's response to the Gulf oil spill, deep water drilling, fracking and negotiation in major conflicts. Um, I think this would be a good time, David, to take it over. And again, um, any questions to Elvis about the Great Green, Elvis Paul about the Great Green Wall Initiative, please put into the chat and he will answer. And one other, one other comment, if you're not presenting, please mute yourself, a little bit of background noise, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Tangum. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, uh, great. So um, I'd like to, uh, thanks, Jonathan, uh, just uh, give a little bit of a sketch of what's going on uh, in the administration on climate change. It's an incredible, uh, important priority for the president, as you know. He identified at the beginning of his administration four, four crises facing America, the health COVID crisis, the economy, uh, inequality, and climate. Uh, climate, one of the top four uh, issues that's facing our country. Uh, and on day one, he did an executive order that uh, fulfilled a number of his campaign promises dealing with climate. Uh, he ordered immediate action on regulations that had been 
turned back by the Trump administration affecting climate, uh, including uh, the uh, uh, the Trump rollback on methane restrictions up from the oil and gas industry, uh, fuel economy standards, energy efficiency standards, uh, the power sector hazardous pollutant standards, uh, the uh, ozone standards, uh, and uh, the the uh, identification of the social cost of greenhouse gases as well. And then on day seven, uh, the 27th of January, he put out the executive order that created my office in the White House uh, and established truly an amazing a whole of government effort to deal with climate change. This was executive order 14,008. It, on the foreign side, it put Secretary Kerry in charge of bringing the U.S. back into the into the uh, Paris Agreement, and that's leading to the COP26 discussions that will occur in about three weeks, less than that now, uh, in uh, Glasgow. Um, and uh, on the domestic side, it established, uh, it, it re recounted the, the president's policy concerns about climate talking about how we're now going to be listening to science. Uh, we're going to be holding polluters accountable. We're going to be driving the federal government to assess, disclose climate pollution and climate related risks for every sector. We're going to increase the resilience of the U.S. to climate impacts. Hang on to that thought. We're going to protect club public health. This is all in the executive order. We're going to conserve our lands and waters and biodiversity. We're going to deliver on environmental justice. We're going to spur economic growth, and we're going to put innovation in the front of row of clean energy technology and infrastructure. Now, how are we going to do that? The president said we're going to create a White House Office of Domestic Policy uh, of Domestic of Climate Policy. That's my office. It's headed up by Gina McCarthy, the National Climate Advisor. There are ten of us who are doing this full time, twenty four seven. Never worked harder in my life, I will comment. Uh, uh, but it's good work, and uh, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to do it. Uh, and it established a National Climate Task Force that our office staffs, which is the entire cabinet of the United States. We have, we have cabinet meetings uh, of this task force every month with an enormous amount of activity in between our meetings. Now, on sp specifics, that executive order uh, and, I, and I'm going to spend a couple of minutes to go through this because it's very important. There's a tendency to think that what matters now is what's in front of the Congress, and that certainly does matter, as I'll talk about. But it's amazing what is going on across the government with this whole government effort, regardless of what happens in the Congress. So the specifics in 14,008 said that we're going to use the federal government in a new, aggressive way when it comes to climate. We're going to have the federal government's procurement policies aligned with our climate policy. We're going, to, we're going to push for a carbon-free electricity sector by 2035, starting with the federal government getting up carbon-free electricity for all of its operations across the board. Uh, we're going to be do, pushing for renewable energy on, clean, uh, on, the, uh, on public lands and on offshore waters. If you've been following offshore uh, wind energy situation, it's unbelievable what we're doing. We're going to have 30 gigawatts of new clean offshore wind energy off the East Coast of the United States by 2030. Uh, we've also opened up the Pacific and the Gulf to wind, en wind energy area uh, areas. And there's enormous draw and, and demand for this clean energy, in part because of the progressive states in the Northeast, as well as now the federal government. Uh, we are going to limit oil and gas on public lands. The, the president put a pause on new, uh, new leasing on public lands. Uh, we've, we're protecting the Arctic wildlife refuge from oil and gas drilling, uh, and we're doing a complete overhaul of the whole federal oil and gas program. Uh, we're not going to be doing any federal funding to subsidize fossil fuels anymore. Uh, that's reflected in the budget for fiscal year 21 and 22, and now 20, soon 23. We're going to use federal funding to spur clean energy innovation and deployment. Uh, every federal agency has, as of last Thursday, uh, has a new climate action plan that, that uh, identifies how in their mission area uh, they are going to be uh, dealing with the adaptation and resilience needs now with climate impacts affecting them. I, 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 ask, I suggest you look at the Department of Defense's uh, energy plan, which you can find from the White House uh, a website from last Thursday. Uh, it's amazing how they recognize 
uh, how climate is impacting their mission and how they're going to deal with it. And, uh, and then last week, uh, on Thursday, or rather it was Tuesday the 12th, we, we, uh, we, we came out with a new policy on climate information products and the part of the challenge of making sure that Americans who are being impacted by climate have the best information about what's affecting them. Uh, we had uh, two important reports come in, as well as some additional information, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, uh, I'll also say that this uh, whole of government approach is, so I've been talking a lot about obviously energy uh, as part of it, but also there's a recognition that conservation is a key part of, of, of dealing with the climate uh, situation. Uh, and the, the executive order called for the creation of a, of, uh, of a uh, rather re reinforced the president's promise to conserve 30% of the land mass and the waters of the US by 2030. Uh, we call it the America the Beautiful uh, Initiative, and we're pushing hard for both working lands and uh, non-working lands to be protected for their carbon benefits. Uh, we've got a Climate Smart Agriculture and Forestry program moving ahead with Secretary Vilsack. Happy to be talking about that. A lot of focus on coastal resilience through NOAA and other agencies. And we've called for a civilian climate corporation to get the youth of America involved in, in, in pushing for climate solutions. Um, uh, and uh, that's in front of the Congress right now. Also, uh, the, there's a, a to, to Michelle's point, there's a recognition that climate is disproportionately affecting important populations. And the, the executive order recognizes that, embraces that, says we're gonna, uh, we're gonna secure environmental justice and spur economic opportunity. It establishes an environmental justice interagency council for marginalized and overburdened communities that have suffered disproportionately from climate impacts. Uh, it also talks about revitalizing energy communities that have been left behind by the transition, recognizing that these are communities with workers who are being displaced. We need to address them uh, and we need to deal with the legacies around them, the, the, the leaking orphan oil and gas wells, the, 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 the abandoned mines that are continuing to produce methane, et cetera, and to help those coal and power plant communities. Um, so, uh, how are we doing all this? Uh, it's it's uh, it's an amazing uh, across the government effort in the transportation sector. So look at look first at emissions, then I want to talk about climate impacts. On the emission side, on the transportation sector, we've been working with the uh, auto industry. We have agreements from the auto industry to by 2030 produce have half the cars and trucks in the U.S. produced uh, being electric. Uh, amazing. We've increased back the, the, the mileage standards. We're pushing for EV, uh, for electric vehicle uh, recharging stations. Uh, already in the bipartisan part of the legislation on the bill, there's $7.5 billion to build half a million recharging stations. And we had an announcement about three weeks ago about a sustainable aviation fuels initiative to produce 3 billion gallons of sustainable biofuels for aviation uh, by 2030. In the power sector, we're pushing for uh, offshore wind and other clean energy. In the industrial sector, uh, we're, we're, we're going back with regulations to stop the uh, emissions of methane from the largest source of, of the super pollutant. We're also working with the ag sector to get methane solution, uh, methane emissions down from that sector. Uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the agricultural sector, climate smart ag and forestry, we're doing looking at negative emissions, in particular by taking advantage of carbon sequestration on public lands and other lands. And then in the adaptation and resilience space, this has been a, an enormous amount of, of tension given to this because of what's happened in the US this, this year. Everyone's been touched by climate impacts. Uh, the Washington Post recently did a, a study showing one out of every three Americans lives in a county or a state that's had a FEMA declaration this year. Two thirds of Americans have been in, a, a, in, a, in an area that's experienced a multi-day multi heat wave event uh, this year. Uh, what have we done? We've established five interagency working groups focused on different climate impacts. We have one on extreme heat, 
We have one on wildfire. We have one on coastal resilience. We have one on flood impacts, and we have one on drought. These are all organized under my office uh, through the, the uh, task force, the, the National Climate Task Force, and they're, they're set up with the experts from the agencies that, that cross agencies that have the major equities here. For example, the Extreme Heat Interagency Working Group is headed up by the new office at the Department of Health and Human Services that we set up under Executive Order 14008 called the Office of Climate Change and, Equ and Health Equity uh, that uh, that and they are joined together with EPA, which has traditionally done a lot of work in this area, and NOAA, the third agency that's traditionally done a lot of work in this area. And you may have noticed that we had an extreme uh, heat fact sheet coming out of the White House about three weeks ago that chronicled how a number of agencies are working together uh, to address this crisis. Um, the uh, uh, it, similarly, uh, on the drought, uh, the drought issue uh, that has been an enormous challenge, uh, USDA and DOI are heading up the, the, the interagency working group. I can talk about more of the, the, about that if there are questions. But let me close with this because um, Michelle uh, asked me to talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the provisions that are on the Hill right now. We're very excited about both the bipartisan uh, uh, framework, uh, infrastructure framework uh, that was passed by the by the Senate uh, uh, in the summer, and it's awaiting final action, and, and the reconciliation bill, which we're watching the sausage being made uh, as we speak, uh, is not a pretty sight. Uh, but when you step back, uh, it's amazing what we potentially will get out of these two pieces of legislation. Um, enormous, enormous financial support on all of these major areas where we need it in terms of the climate crisis. The bipartisan infrastructure framework, for example, has enormous investments in public transit, uh, in electrifying school buses and transit buses, in the electric vehicle charging stations that I mentioned. We're talking about more than $10 billion, more like $20 billion, actually much more than that, uh, in this transportation sector. The, the, it's 15 billion only for EV chargers and electrification of school buses. In the transmission area, we need better transmission in order to get the clean energy, the new clean energy to the load centers. We have new authority under the bipartisan agreement to give DOE the planning and, and financial wherewithal to drive new interregional transmission like we've never had before. It also has billions of dollars for grid modernization and for resilience of the, of the grid. For methane, we've got um, $12 billion uh, plus another $5 billion for mine reclamation and oil and gas uh, reclamation. In re for resilience, I'm gonna close with this. For resilience, we have over $50 billion in order to help our, get our, our forests more healthy, deal with our Western water needs and drought needs around the country, give weatherization uh, that includes cooling capabilities uh, to our homes, not just heat and insulation anymore, but cooling as well. And we've got huge uh, tens of billions of dollars in clean energy investments from hydrogen to storage to battery recycling, et cetera. The reconciliation bill will do more. It will provide more incentives for electric vehicles. It will provide tax incentives for transmission and for solar and wind. It'll provide money for the Civilian Climate Corps. It'll provide more money for climate smart ag and forestry, more money for green banks that will enable much more uh, penetration of clean energy in environmental justice communities. And that doesn't even get to the issue everyone's talking about right now, which is the electricity sector. So uh, just have a little uh, step back and take a look at this. It's an amazing, we're on the a threshold of a potentially amazing additional uh, thrust of money and policy into the climate arena that's unprecedented. But also keep in mind that even without that, we have a president completely dedicated to this area doing amazing work. So I went longer than I should have, Michelle. I hope you'll forgive me. No, that's okay, David. Um, we'll, everybody's going longer. We're going to try to uh, take a few questions. 
um, from the audience. Um, and one question, Carrie, do you want to unmute yourself? Oh, and sure. Thanks. Go ahead, Carrie. Um, quick question, David. Thank you so much. That was really an excellent overview. My question to you, and I hope you're going to COP26, is what do you think from your standpoint or from the Biden administration's standpoint is the most important focus of COP26 this year? Um, I think it's a, it's a high level focus that's needed, which is to get the world back on track to make climate a priority. I mean, there will be a number, as you know, Carrie, of, of specific initiatives. There's a uh, initiative to agree to get uh, the major economies agreeing to cut methane emissions by 30% by 3030. There's a, um, efforts to proliferate the 30 by 30 uh, um, efforts in terms of, of uh, conservation and, and many others. But, but honestly, I think it's, it's mainly to, um, uh, to, to recognize the obligation and in the international area, which I work less in, as you can tell, to provide the world with the financial backing for the major economies to deal with the crisis that we have abroad. Uh, and that's that's where you've seen a big forward lean by Secretary Kerry and his team and, and the U.S. Um, the, the, the issues of climate migration, of the disproportionate impacts on communities that uh, cannot escape the incredible health problems associated with fossil fuel uh, combustion are just enormous. Uh, we see that here in the U.S., but it and it's terrible, uh, as you well know from your work in the Fresno Valley uh, and, and the Central Valley, Fresno, et cetera, the, the climate, the, the recognition of the, of the health effects of our current fossil fuel based economy are tremendous. And uh, so uh, anyway, there's, there's so much to do. Just just getting getting folks back on track, uh, I think, is the main thing. Uh, maybe one last question. Uh, Linda Freed, do you want to ask your question? Sure, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for this amazing and inspiring and uh, highly hopeful work. Um, I, I just, I didn't clearly hear um, the thinking and plans around how to rapidly modernize and invest in a 21st century US public health system that could really be on the ground and at the state and national levels in an integrated way to protect human health. And I was wondering what the plans are on that. Well, um, the, uh, uh, you know, we, we absolutely need, obviously, the, the public health system is strained. Uh, and um, in terms of climate, uh, we've got some, uh, folks on this call, including Jonathan and others who've been preaching for some time, and Michelle and many others, and you, I'm sure, about the importance of, of the, the climate slash health nexus. Um, it's not been a primary uh, focus. I will tell you that it's one of Gina McCarthy's primary focuses. And as you may know, after she left the NRDC, she was at the Harvard School of Public Health and uh, is, is a strong proponent. It's one of the reasons why the president established this new unit at Health and Human Services and recruited some good folks so far. Um, unfortunately, we uh, because of the budget sort of stalemate we've had at the Hill, we don't have the funding yet to fully stand up that unit. Uh, they're doing a great job basically borrowing folks from different parts of HHS. But I, I predict uh, once we get you know, a real budget through here, and we get the several million dollars into that unit, um, a given, given the president's uh, focus on it, uh, Gina McCarthy's focus on it, Secretary Becerra's focus on it, he's got some very good people, Arsenio Mataka, who is, is one of his right hands when he was in California, uh, involved in a John Balbus, who many of you may know, um, uh, I think we're going to see uh, some real advances there. Uh, and, and we're excited because the whole of government frame we have around climate provides the room now to bring health into the equation in a way it's never been brought into the equation before. Wow, David, that is, that's music to my ears, of course. And I just want to 
thank you. Uh, we are so grateful that you're leading this whole of campus, uh, whole of campus, whole of government, <laughs> whole of government uh, approach. And it's just, it's, I mean, it's just one of these, oh my gosh, moments for me that this is amazing. Thank you so much for this leadership. I, I, and incredible I, think news. A, I think there was a comment that you should go on MSNBC because the left is cynical. I think that came from David Rossner. <laughs> so yeah, you thank you. David, thank you so much. And uh, this is incredible out of the Biden administration and your leadership. So we do need to move on. And ba based uh, off of your incredible progress, now it's time to turn to next steps and where we go from here. And we have two uh, distinguished speakers uh, that are going to take us there. First is um, Francesca uh, Dominici, who is the co-director of the Harvard Data Science Initiative and the Clarence James Gamble Professor of Biostatistics, Population and Data Science at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Uh, she is an expert in causal inference, machine learning, air pollution, and climate change. Uh, Dr. Dominici will tell us about the future of science predictions with particular focus on data science and cutting edge mechanisms to assess vulnerabilities. And following her, uh, Maureen Litchfeld is the Dean of the Graduate School of Public Health at the University of Pittsburgh. She'll also, she also serves as professor of environmental and occupational health and is the Jonas Salk Professor of Population Health. Her environmental health research spans from risk assessment of chemicals and disasters to health disparities and climate change. Uh, she will summarize um, what we've heard all day and, we're, and uh, through the three lenses of science, policy, and practice, try to highlight the next steps and key action strategies. Thank you, Francesca, take it away. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, fasten your seatbelt, both because I'm gonna go very fast, but also because I'm gonna tell you where the science is going and projecting in the future. I also think that my talk is also linked to uh, Linda Fried comment about how do we modernize US public health system and something that I know for a fact by being interacting with Gina McCarthy, that's something that she will be highly receptive to. So I'm just gonna give you immediately my key points. Um, one is, of course, I'm coming from a world of data scientists. I'm a data scientist. I do think that we now have a wealth of information from satellite data science and atmospheric chemistry and machine learning. They are really allowing us both at the domestic level and the global level to pinpoint and estimate exposure to climate change related exposures such as wildfire and droughts and heat wave with an unprecedented precision. Therefore, also we have advanced methodology that allow us to link and assess a causal link between exposure to climate change and health outcome, including the most vulnerable population. Just so I pointed out this week, the Nobel Prize winner in, in, the, um, in the economics, uh, among them is Guido Imbens so talking about causal inference for natural experiment. And this is really the era that we're talking about here. And then we have been seeing emergency, emerging evidence of a link between air pollution, wildfires and COVID that really allow us to and think about an additional sense of urgency. So a critical point that many of you know, the climate change and air pollution share same sources. So uh, um, attacking climate change, sorry, attacking air pollution and uh, fossil fuel uh, emission is actually a very effective way to targeting uh, greenhouse gases emission. We have learned now in the context of the Clean Air Act that with amount of data, with data science and by providing evidence, on link between air pollution exposure and health had led to policy change and have led indeed to breathing cleaner air. There is other good news is that as we know, the WHO uh, very recently, a few weeks ago, had revised their national, their, um, their quality standards, getting from 10 micrograms per cubic meter to five micrograms per cubic meter. And so basically that said that, that effort to car pollution by reducing fossil fuel use would provide a double benefit in both improving public health conditions and in bringing down climate warming emissions. So I have a big problem. I am a big, 
a, a big uh, advocate for building national and global data platform that will allow us to assess exposure to climate change, that will allow us to quantify health impact to climate change, and will allow us to pinpoint who are the more vulnerable. So as we are thinking about how to regulate greenhouse gases emission, at the same time, we can protect the most vulnerable population. And so we have now across, actually there is a profound work in the United States that is a consortium that I am a member together with the Melman School of Public Health, with Yale University, with Boston University. And of course, I'm from the Harvard THN School of Public Health, where we are indeed putting together a national data platform that will allow us to estimate exposure to wildfires, to drought, to tropical cyclone, to heat waves, to link to um, health data from the uh, Medicare and Medicaid services, as well as a national cohort. And again, able to quantify on a national and also global scale, the impact of climate change. We can uh, um, estimate exposure to temperature, extreme and, and, and um, temperature variability with uh, the level of accuracy actually much, much higher than the county at the, up to three kilometer, three kilometer resolution. We already know, know a lot about the health impact from heat, heat waves, which I'm not gonna um, go through here again. Um, we are, and this is work led by my colleague at the Melma School of Public Health, have the opportunity to estimate and quantify the exposure to tropical cyclone and linking to hospitalization rate. There is work on wildfires that actually is telling us that in the future, we, we are moving from 57 million of people that have been exposed to wildfire exposure up to 82 million uh, between 2046 and 2051. And also when I pointed out emerging work from my team that are linking exposure to wildfire exposure to COVID, that these are linking directly to the wildfire that we had last year with COVID. There is a national platform um, well, in a, a, a platform specifically for the state that have been exposed to wildfires, where in similar as we have been monitoring COVID, we can also start monitoring COVID-19 cases and deaths that are directly and causally attributable to excess PM 2.5 during the wildfire day. So this is a public available and you can find this, this platform. And so this is really the additional monitoring and surveillance that, that we can do. And we also know, and this is adding additional level of urgency, that exposing population are, 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 are fine to find particular matter air pollution, but also to NO2 has making the uh, health outcome of the pandemic worse and has increased the mortality rate for people that have been tested positive for COVID. We have estimated that in all in North America, for example, 14% of the number of deaths for COVID are indeed attributable to fossil fuel related emission. The number for Europe is 13%, in East Asia is 15%, and North American, as I said, 14%. So I'm gonna really quickly uh, conclude with my last two slides. One is the steps needed to mitigate climate change in the future are substantially the same as those that need to reduce the burden of that and this ability to do air pollution in the present. So cut back on both non-burning fossil fuel and biomass. And I really hope that in the US, we will follow the leadership of the WHO and lowering the national ambient air quality standard for fine particular matter. In the meantime, um, I am a strong advocate that machine learning and data science allow us to measure exposure to this climate change related disaster to pinpoint with incredible amount of precision susceptibility and vulnerability. So then when we try to allocate and we aim to allocate billion of dollars for policy, we know who is gonna benefit the most and we know which policy will matter the most. And again, I think remind us this week with the Nobel Prize in economics that um, we don't know, Invents has been teaching us that through natural experiment, we can indeed assess causality and so in this context of climate change or exposure, we are often you know, dealing with natural 
disaster. So we can really learn and um, borrow this, this mentality to really thinking about causal attribution. So uh, my own perspective on looking ahead, we need data, we need data, we have data, we just have to get ourselves organized to be able to integrate, harmonize and uh, provide access to this data, both at the US level and at the global level. There are now, uh, we have the expertise, so we have the tech, tech, technology, we have the ability to maintain privacy. And uh, I think, in my own opinion, is that they will really allow us to better understand the distribution of, of infect, um, in, in the disadvantaged portion of the population. Thank you. Francesca, thank you so much. That's a lot to chew on. Really, really uh, some <laughs> valuable information. Maureen, um, you have the, you're next. Um, so, wow. Um, how to summarize this in a few minutes. We're very thankful for everyone who participated. Um, and uh, my task, is to do that to, to summarize this in through three lenses science policy and practice the absolute bottom line for us in the area of science is that we are responsible for making science make climate and health science work for those most vulnerable across all presentations every single presenter um, talked about issues of equity and issues of vulnerability. Paul Schramm and Jonathan Petz pointed out equity and social vulnerability. Uh, Carrie and Phil pointed out the, the amount of pollution that wildfires bring so much more um, and that climate change and wildfires have actually have a reciprocal relationship. Um, Alphas brought up the impact of drought, again, on the most vulnerable populations and particularly um, focused on mental health uh, and identify drought as one of the areas where we don't have enough data. Um, David Hayes, um, I, couldn't spe I couldn't write quick enough on his comments, but what's most striking there, and I'll talk a little bit about policy in a minute, is the, the, um, the approach of it to be the whole government, just like in the past we did the whole a system when we address disasters. And then just now Dominici mandating that we focus on data platforms that go far beyond health data and include weather data and others so that we have a transdisciplinary platform to be able to look into the future. Now, policy. We've heard that modeling from Carrie and from uh, Francesca, that modeling can inform policy and that policy in turn can impact people, especially those most vulnerable. Um, we heard specifically from David that a climate focus must include um, science, must include resilience, must include um, protecting public health and a special uh, emphasis on environmental justice, must include identifying those risks and dealing both with emissions and with adaptation. He also indicated that uh, beyond um, just saying it's resilience, there's money, there are funds around it for forest, for water preservation, um, for clean energy. And then in the area of practice, Paul um, Schramm brought us back to where it really matters vulnerable communities and CDC surveillance efforts in multiple cities. Carrie again emphasized why vulnerable populations are such a, an emphasis um, that we can't ignore. And Alphas brought up that nature-based solutions actually will help us address more resilience uh, adaptation and mitigation measures. On um, further on the practice side, Francesca really pointed out the need for transdisciplinary data for action. And so our effort today doesn't stand alone. Uh, it was preceded by just Friday, uh, in a workshop, a summit convened by the Consortium of University of Global Health 
that looked at climate and health through three lenses, energy, transportation, agriculture, green financing, and policy implementations. And there, again, there were some very provocative issues, such as revisiting whether cheap food is really cheap. Might be cheap for humans, but definitely not cheap for the ecosystem. Um, the, the focus on local, where the action is, and protecting one special aspect of vulnerable, uh, 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 vulnerable uh, populations, and those are our indigenous uh, brothers and sisters. Um, preceding that was a conference focused on um, small island nations in the Caribbean, where the impact of climate change was particularly cumulative, building on persisting, uh, persistent health disparities, environmental health disasters, and natural disasters. And then, of course, coming up it was our own uh, conference tomorrow, which you've heard from President Saul about. And then in March um, and early April, um, the COGH annual conference on healthy people, healthy planet, and social justice. And so um, I couldn't agree, and, and thanking Linda Fried to pay attention to the floor of the house. And the floor of the house in public health is our public health infrastructure, where we have several of us emphasizing the need for a new workforce a climate and health workforce, where we work with accrediting bodies in medicine and public health and other health professionals to require that our future health professionals and our current health professionals know something about the relationship between climate and health. <clears throat> and that local partnerships, also those that are not so traditional, really matter. And so as we transition into um, the q and I'd really like to invite David Rosner now for, with a special request. I'm going to un unmute you, David, because yeah, exactly. this is the, a okay, pragmatic, a pragmatic thing that our group can do. So please, go uh, forward. Uh, uh, because of a number of other issues, I happened to be in contact with Sheldon Whitehouse last week, and uh, uh, he and I and Phil Andrigan, I'm sure many of you have had contact with him over the years. He's been the most outspoken. Uh, member of the Congress about uh, climate change, the impact of dark money on the manipulation of industrial opposition to climate actions, uh, global warming, etc. And I think you know most of you know this, but um, in the course of the discussion, I briefly mentioned that we were meeting uh, at the NAM, and he was quite interested. He said, you know, you could be of great help. Uh, as a matter of fact. I sent him a little message now saying that we're actually meeting and he wrote back next week's the next weeks will be critical uh, and what he's talking about are a couple of propositions very practical propositions which i now feel a little awkward mentioning after hearing david's global view of what's going on uh, these seem rather trivial but he had a couple of very specific uh prop issues that he wants to raise uh for inclusion in the uh reconciliation bill and he says the next couple of weeks is, are very critical. Um, I've asked him to literally just now, I've asked him to write out this, you know, the specifics in English, uh, what we could do and whether or not what specifics might be useful to him. And that we, I would then present it to us and see whether or not it was appropriate for us as a group, either to sign a petition, write a letter, give some uh, the imprimatur of some sense of the uh, climate group at the NAM uh, to his initiative. So I'm gonna, he said he'll get us something in the next week or so, um, a few days, I should say. Um, and I can forward it, I guess, to Michelle and to, uh, to John um, and see how, where it goes, what you guys wanna do with it. Um, I think, you know, he's an extraordinary uh, advocate uh, and an extraordinary figure in the Senate. And he thinks that there's really, ironically, you know, because I always think I'm kind of down after reading too, you know, watching too much MSNBC, um, but he's not, and uh, nor uh, is David. So I presume that there's really something that can happen. So I'll wait, I'll wait word, I guess. Is that the appropriate thing to do? Yeah. I'll wait with him and then forward it to you. And then we can go from there and see what you want to do. 
right? I think we need to check. I don't know if uh, Victor is still on, um, whether we can, in a, in a way, this is a lobbying letter, and I'm not sure that we're allowed to, it's a National Academy lobby, but I think we can maybe send a letter with, all, it, maybe somebody on this um, group session. Lynn, do you, is that you raising your hand? Uh, yeah. uh, Michelle, I don't think that our section per se can do that as an organization, but I think that we as members can send a letter, you know, we, the members of the National Academy of Medicine assert the following, and, and I think that's very powerful, and I've done it before, and I think we could also, by the way, engage other members who are not in this section, so we might even potentially be able to have more people um, signing on. I, there's nothing wrong with that. But I don't think that we can do it as the academy or even a section of the academy. But that's I think right. that's okay, um, and we can and we can say we're members um, in such a letter. Um, that's fine, as well as our other titles. I mean, I, you know, I I can say I'm a dean as long as it's clear I'm not representing the view of the it's of that organization. But that that identifies me. I can certainly say that as well as well as you know everybody else on here. Um, if anybody had a Nobel Prize, they can say that too. Um, anyway, that's I'm fantastic. not sure that's you here. I'll just let him know and I'm sure he'll get us something uh, rather soon and then we can, you know, fine tune it, adjust it as, as you know, John and, and Michelle think are appropriate or others think right. are appropriate. And David, if you can get a, um, a sort of a drop dead deadline from him besides being yesterday or tomorrow, right. then maybe, maybe between you, Michelle and I, we can, you know, draft a petition group and get it going and yeah. meet a deadline. Right. I think that would be great. Great. Okay. You know, Thank you, David. Of, it's very practical and very immediate, and it'll give us some sense of uh, something that we're doing. I thought. Right. Right. And, to, and to put in a word for it, actually, David, um, one thing that I think is really important is that while it's possible to do it, to do things that have a permanent impact, because I mean, after all, you can decide you're not going to take, you know, gas out of the out of the ground and burn it this year, but next year it's still there and people can do that. And so things that can be done, and I think we may need Congress to do them that leave a permanent imprint are really important. You know, I think that's really what he is aiming at. He's really looking for very fundamental changes in federal policy and industrial activities and actions and, mm -hmm. you know, around climate change, around CO2, around methane, et cetera. So it'll be very practical, I think. And things that really involve multiple partners on the ground, including our communities yeah. and our local and state health departments. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll forward a message to him and I'm sure he'll get back very quickly. Thanks. Yeah, with a focus on environmental justice as well. Yes, yes. correct. But I think we should probably end this session. Um, I want to thank my co-chair, Jonathan, um, and the steering group, um, Maureen, Phil, uh, Francesca, uh, for, for putting this session together. It was outstanding. And uh, to be continued, um, one of the things that sort of drives me a little nuts as we have these great conversations and then we don't go forward. And that's why we asked Maureen to push us forward. And I, David, I think this is great. We have a pragmatic um, really decision to go forward. Um, and so that would be really, um, to me, make this session even more meaningful. So I'm supposed to announce that there is a, an awards program at four o'clock um, we have a few more minutes. Does anybody else want to say anything? Just a random thought, um, Michelle. It may actually be possible for us to send a letter as the Academy to the Congress, given that the NAS charter is, in fact, to advise the Congress. I'm not sure, but it may be worth looking into it. Lynn may know more about this than I do, but... That advice comes from consensus committee. So... I mean, so uh, Victor mentioned there is a consensus committee that's a part of his um, process. And so that can lead to that. But mm -hmm. if you need something mm -hmm. about legislation that's like next week, a committee doesn't work that fast, right? So I think that, um, I think that's, I mean, possibly they already have consensus reports they could rely on, but possibly it gets bogged down in that. Um, there's Victor, hi. Yeah. 
Victor back. I was, listening, oh, I was listening to your conversation. Let me clarify a few issues. Uh, as an academy, or bodies of the academy, we are prohibited from advocating anything in Congress or US government. It's part of the uh, 501c3 status. What Lynn said was US individuals can put together a letter and certainly have been done filled with NAS or NAM. Members who can put together a letter and you can identify your members. So that's, that's fine. Then you're not officially speaking for us, but you're speaking as individuals collectively, but you know, as members of NAM, NAS, you name it. I think that's, uh, as, as Lynn said, it would be even great if you include other uh, organizations you're involved with. Just that clarity. And I think uh, it's By the way, I really, I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation and thank you, Dave, the two Davids, for bringing some of those things up. As you know, we are very closely engaging with, uh, with Biden administration through HHS, Rachel Levine, uh, Asenio Mataka, and John Balbus. We've also engaged with Gina McCarthy and others. So, uh, and David, I look forward to getting to know you, David Meyer. Well, thank you. Thanks, Victor, for clarifying that. Um, and I think we'll try to move that letter forward, David. Um, so just get it to Jonathan and me, that would be good. As soon as I get it, I'll send it. So I'd like to thank all of the speakers, as I started to say, the, the committee, um, Victor, for actually pushing this issue forward um, and to be continued tomorrow at the annual meeting um, where there's a great deal about climate and climate and health. So take care, everybody. Stay safe. Stay thank well. You. Thank you. And thank you.